read Philippians, the second chapter. And for his children, we are to submit to his authority. We want to speak to you again today, and as we're thinking together this month, about what we believe. Hear it back to the Bible broadcast. We felt that it was essential and necessary that you get the basic truth of what back to the Bible believes. I know you've heard us over and over and over again, but we're stating it uh, this way, and we have it in a little booklet. Uh, most of you possibly have it by, on hand by right now. This we believe. So today we want to talk to you about the Holy Spirit. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank you that we can come in the name of Jesus Christ, and we can by thy grace lay out thy word and make it very clear. So grant again today that great things shall be done to thy honor and to thy glory, for we ask it in Jesus' glorious name. Amen. Now the statement of faith concerning the Holy Spirit, we simply say this, and I shall read it for you. We believe that the Holy Spirit is a divine person, the third person of the Trinity. We believe that he was sent from the Father by the Son to convict the world, number one, Second, to regenerate. Third, to indwell those who trust in Christ. Fourth, to baptize them into the body of Jesus Christ. Fifth, to seal them for a final day of redemption. Sixth, to guide them into all truth. And seventh, to fill them uh, for the life of holiness and victory. And eighth, to empower them for a witness of service. And then also we believe that he gives spiritual gifts to believers for the proper functioning of the body of Jesus Christ, which is the church and of which you and I, therefore, are members. Now, uh, at the back of the Bible, this doctrinal statement that I just read to you about the Holy Spirit, uh, we affirm ten things about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, which we believe are very important and that we need to clarify for you. First, we affirm both the deity and the personality of the Holy Spirit. As the third, he is the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit necessarily partakes of the essential nature of the Godhead. The scriptures affirm both the deity and the personality of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit does not have a body. That's not what I mean by personality. But he is a person to whom you can talk. And notice what it says in Acts, the fifth chapter, verses three and four. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You can't lie to an influence, but it's a person. So he says, to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the land. Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And there he identifies this person as being God. Now in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of John, verse 13 and 14, we have these statements. Notice how many times he speaks of the Holy Spirit as he. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself. For whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak. And he shall show these things unto you. And he shall glorify me. Well, I think that's sufficient. Therefore we maintain uh, that he is more than a mere impersonal influence in this world, but that he is a person and that he is God. Secondly, the Holy Spirit was sent from the Father by the Lord Jesus Christ for a very special ministry in this world. We read in John the 14th chapter, verse 16 and 17, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, and that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. That's the Holy Spirit. Whom the world cannot receive, because they seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he now dwelleth with you. This is what, what Jesus said when he was then speaking. He was with you, but he shall be in you. How wonderful that is. He shall teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things whatsoever I have taught you. Now this is not to say that the Holy Spirit did not have a ministry before the time of Christ. It is rather to emphasize that the Spirit is in the world today to fulfill a divine task and a very special ministry in this particular age. Thirdly, 
Uh, although the New Testament emphasizes the Holy Spirit's ministry to the believers, there is one uh, stated ministry which he fulfills in this world as a whole, that is, to convict men of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. We read in John the 16th chapter, and I'll read just one verse or so. Verse 8, And when he is come, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. This ministry of the Holy uh, Spirit uh, preserves a moral sensitivity in the world of corruption, of sin, in which we live. Fourthly, the Holy Spirit first regenerates, second, indwells those who trust in Christ for salvation. Now, these two are simultaneous works of the Holy Spirit, regeneration and the indwelling. He is the divine agent for imparting the life of Christ to the believer. Take, for instance, what we read in John, the third chapter, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. For that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit of the, is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, he must be born again. And once more in John, the sixth chapter, verse 63, he says, It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words which I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. And the Holy Spirit makes them real to us. And that is, the Holy Spirit makes the word, through the word of God, regenerates the soul. And then he indwells that person. So through residing then in each believer, as we've already read from John the 14th chapter, he indwells you. Uh, then uh, he uh, there does the living in us. Let's read also another verse or two, 1 Corinthians 3.16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which ye have of God, and that ye are not your own? No one possesses eternal life, which is the life from God, without the Holy Spirit's work and without his indwelling, for he produces that life through Jesus Christ. Fifth, the Holy Spirit baptizes each believer into the corporate spiritual body of Jesus Christ at the time that the believer comes to saving faith in Christ Jesus. Let me read for you 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Now the baptism in or by the spirit, which is, was promised first of all by John the Baptist, uh, was uh, historically fulfilled on the day of Pentecost when the spirit came upon the in, uh, original believers in a unique event which formed the New Testament church. Let me read a couple of verses. Mark, the first chapter, verse 8. John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Or as we read further in Acts, the first chapter, Jesus now speaking to his disciples, when he says in the first chapter, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. Then the second chapter in the fourth verse gives us the fulfilling of that event. For they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now we do not believe that the baptism of the Spirit should be confused with the ministry of the filling by the Holy Spirit. Get this. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a spiritual ministry rather than an experience. It is God doing something for us. It is something God does with and for the believer, rather than something a believer experiences uh, sometime later after his conversion. Many are confused about this. I'm sorry about that. On the sixth, the Holy Spirit seals each believer for the final day of redemption. In Ephesians, the first chapter, 13 and 14, we read, In whom ye also trusted. 
And then the 14th verse, Ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Well, since God's work of total redemption in the believer is not completed at the moment of conversion, nor even in this life, God has given the Holy Spirit as a guarantee and as a foretaste of the final redemption. To further explain this, what I mean by that statement is this. Now, justification, which is our salvation, that is finished. That is completed the moment we are saved. But our sanctification, which has to do with our walk, is a continuous working of the Holy Spirit in our life as we walk upon this earth. But there's still a third step, and that is glorification, uh, when we shall be heaven-bound, when God will come in Christ and take us home uh, to heaven. Seventh, the Holy Spirit guides each believer into truth. We noticed that already as we were reading in John. John, the 14th chapter, and in verse 26, I read these words. And he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have taught you. Or as we read in the 16th chapter of John, verse 13, howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. And he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak, and he shall show you things to come. Also, he is the divine agent who opens the minds of the believer so that they can understand the scriptures and the truth of God. Take, for instance, what he says in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, verse 9 to 12. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have uh, uh, entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. There is a key. God hath revealed these. He opens our minds to understand. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of this world, but the Spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us by God. So the Holy Spirit opens our minds to see and comprehend these things. This does not mean that the believer becomes infallible in his understanding of truth. It means that the believer, through the help of the Spirit, is able to gain the correct perspective on reality and come to the correct use of his mind, which the believer, without the Spirit, is absolutely unable to do. Number eight. It is the ministry of the Holy Spirit to fill and to control each believer so he can live a life of holiness and victory right here on earth. He says in Ephesians 5, verse 18, Be not drunk with wine where, uh, in his excess, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. So as the Spirit progressively fills and controls the life of the believer, the will of God, which is the believer's sanctification, is progressively accomplished in that person's life. It is the believer's duty to yield to the control of the Spirit and to walk according to the Spirit so that the fruit of the Spirit may be produced in us. Walk after the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And now to the ninth point I want to mention is that the Holy, as the Holy Spirit fills the believer so he also empowers him as a witness for service. You shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. It was strikingly evident in the lives of the apostles uh, when they were first weak and fearful personalities that they were transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit to give bold, persuasive witness to the truth of the gospel. Take Peter's first sermon uh, when he preached to them. He says, and when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, and they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And church history is full of examples of people who have been empowered by the Holy Spirit in this manner, filled and empowered. Now in the tenth place, it is the ministry of the Holy Spirit to give spiritual gifts to all of God's people so that as many, uh, with many aspects of the Christian work may be fulfilled. You find this in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. Our time is about gone. We can't talk, uh, read it now. 
Specific spiritual gifts are listed in various places in the Bible, and all the gifts must be exercised under the controlling influence of the love of God and the working of the Holy Spirit. Uh, We believe that the sign gifts do not play a very prominent role today, but, and that the gift of tongues is not a test of whether we are spirit-filled. We believe that all of the gifts must function in the context of the fruit of the Spirit. Thank you for listening to Back to the Bible. Join us again tomorrow as we listen to Theodore M's message. God bless you.